right, guys. I'm um, going to call the meeting to order at 7 o'clock on the 28th. Welcome, everybody. We are in super hybrid form. We're on WebEx. We're in person today. Um, and we have anybody on the phone? We have Nick Caruso on the phone. Uh, we have Russ Atkins on WebEx. And we have Scott Boss from Harbor Vest on WebEx. Excellent. All right. Here we go. Um, first up, we will not be joined uh, this evening by our, our first one. She's got a personal emergency yep. deal with her mom, so we wish her well. Yep. Um, nice. um, let's go right to it, guys. Um, here, consider and approve the minutes. Uh, the June 23rd regular meeting. Um, making sure everyone had a comment. They could send them around to her. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes for a Second. 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 All in favor to approve the minutes. Jenny, aye. One amendment. Um, one, two, three, four. Fourth line in section four, it just says Harbor Best Term. I think it's what it means. Harbor Best Term. Term. Yeah, not term. Okay. Um, we're going to switch it up uh, the presentation order here a little bit, guys. Um, we're going to start with a quick overview, of a quick review that's going to be 10 minutes or so from Harvard Map. This was in, this is a conjunction with the discussion we had on private equity that Jack Mahoney led us through last month. Um, and we asked Harbor Bus to come back and give us some refresher. So, right. I'm just to Brian and okay. to <clears throat> Yeah, good. Thank you, Carolyn. And before I with Scott, I'd say thank you for the committee just the level of engagement on this. I know we've been talking about it for a year, but it's certainly appropriate when you're talking about a long term commitment. So, uh, making sure we have the due diligence and uh, full understanding of everything. So, I know we had uh, Harbor Bus in last year. Um, and there was some turnover in the board, so it was appropriate to have one of the best in again. As you can see on the screen, we're joined by Scott Boss. He's one of the managing directors out of Boston. He's been with Harbor Best since 1999, and he also is chair of the firm's primary committee, you know, both in the U.S., but also in emerging markets and, and Asia. So I'm glad he could join us. And from the last committee meeting, just to set the agenda, we talked about giving Scott about 10 minutes, uh, if that's still an appropriate time, but of course, leaving as much time for Q&A. Uh, does that still sound appropriate? Yes. And then the topics that we that came up in last meeting for Harbor Best is to address, that they can address everything, anything, but talked about the strengths and the differentiators of that firm, um, as well as what diversification, what benefit does it give you the town as investors. And anything about the term structure? I know those are some questions that came up, but I'll let the committee direct any of the questions out there. Um, one thing I'll say is maybe my colleague Ariel Feingold is also on the line, part of the private investment team. This was a very long due diligence process on our side. This goes all the way up to Bangladesh Board of Directors. We want to make sure we find the right investment partner uh, for the long term and feel confident we have that with uh, Harbor Bank. So I'm not going to speak any longer. I'm going to turn it over to Scott and then also let the committee jump in. Scott, are you still with us? Yeah. Mario, can you hear us fine? Can't hear her. You, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Scott was up on the screen, um, and then he just dropped off. And this, you know, no need for video, but it doesn't sound like he's done. We might have lost Scott. It's been such an easy process the past year and a half. It's shocking. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens when you go low tech? 
first time this has happened. Brian, I can even have, I see Scott dropped for a second, because he's going to try and get back in. Okay. Um, but I can have him even call into yourself. But it would be useful. We're still we're still navigating the virtual world. Right. Let me uh, make sure he has your stuff. Well, he no can problem. call into that main number, get on our speaker. Yeah, I'm looking for your email, Chris, that has the dial in. Uh, um, I'll give you a dial in is, um, are you on the WebEx? Uh, I'm not in the WebEx. Okay. So you can give it to Ariel. Ariel, the, the audio connection is 1-510. Three three eight nine four three eight. Okay. And then the meeting number is two nine two four six eight nine nine eight. Okay. Liz Poo. This is part of Vanguard. Yes. So she's with Vanguard as well. Yeah. Hi, Lynn. Oh. Okay. So I just sent um, Scott while he's navigating his internet issues, the number of the dialer that you just read to me. So thank you very much for that. And also Brian Sell, if you want to speak or phone him in. Um, so he has both of those. I'm happy to take. Uh, any part that the Vanguard side can help. I, as Brian mentioned, I am on the private message team and Liz who is joining me. Um, so happy to take that in the interim while Scott gets on and hopefully it'll just be in a few minutes. But uh, Or if there are other business you want to conduct. But uh, I know he's, he's working to get back in. Yeah, I got a message from him as well. Hello, Liz. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. Hey, Scott. Were you back with us? Okay, now we're right. Where? I'm not sure. You still have all the old selections up here, too. Oh, is that? Oh, there. There's Scott. There he is. Engine funds and down the fence foundations 
Sovereign Wealth Fund. So uh, thank you again for your interest in Copper Vest. Um, we, we like to think that we're one of the few. Um, as I noted, we, we are a pioneer. Uh, Brooks Dog and Ed King, who founded our firm, I think literally invented the, the model that we're still executing on today. And it's the great that we've been all able to learn from that. We consider our firm a platform. So private markets are all that we do. We give our, our clients access to private markets in very different ways through different strategies and different geographies. But as a platform, all the geographies and strategies that we execute on integrate well together to give us just a competitive advantage uh, against many of our peers. Uh, we, we believe because of our, our depth and our scope that we have access to better information and frankly access to better deals and that results in very good performance for, for our investors. Um, we are an independent firm, so we're owned by the employees. There's about 20 of my fellow colleagues and managing directors who are our owners and partners of the firm and we value that independence um, as, a, as a private market firm. Uh, if, if you were to look around the globe, we have 12 offices around the world. It's fair to say that our, our local headquarters are based, our U.S. headquarters is based in Boston. Uh, European headquarters is based in London. And our Asia headquarters is based in Hong Kong. But we're in the process of moving that to, to Singapore. And in, in addition to those three offices, we have nine other offices in various uh, countries around the world. And the, the strategy that will be executed on um, in the program that you're, you're evaluating is what we would call a platform strategy. It, it is global and invests in our primary uh, strategy and invests through our secondary strategy and invests through our direct co-investment strategy. So this is a, a product that gives investments access to all that Harvard Best believes that it does really, really well. Um, from a governance and decision-making standpoint, and this will be the last thing I'll comment on, and then we can open it up to questions. Uh, we have a, a, it's a partnership stru structure uh, where the owners are the decision-makers, uh, but to streamline decision-making, we have an office at the CEO that we call um, the, uh, the EMC. That, that office is headed by my colleague John Tooney and my colleague Peter Wilson. And then we have strategy heads in each of our groups. So we have our primary group, our secondary group, our direct co investment group, our real assets team, and our credit team. And as I know, we didn't have the head of the, the primary investment team. Um, maybe the last comment we made was that it's billion. That's roughly about 50 billion on the primary side, roughly uh, 20 billion on the other side. Actually, 40 billion on the primary side, 20 billion. I'll stop there. Hopefully, that was um, at least the uh, level of detail you were looking for, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, Scott, thank you very much. Thanks very much for presenting to us. Um, Jack, I feel like I can kind of turn to you and see if you have any questions. Maybe kind of let the charge for us on this. Sure. I, I think that that's a great overview of the of the company and kind of the, kind of what the structure is of the fund. Can you tell us a little bit more? You head up the primaries. Can you tell us, you know, maybe a little bit more about, um, you know, asset selection and how you go out and find the firms? Absolutely. Um, so through the, the primary strategy, um, and I'll talk specifically to the opportunity that we're considering. Um, we evaluate fund investment opportunities around the world, so U.S., Europe, and Asia. And we, we broadly define those different types of opportunities as venture capital, growth equity, and leverage on that. Um, the, the manager that you'll find in your portfolio will be, the strategy is to select the most proven and consistent performing managers that are executing on private equity in the world. Um, so we, we do have some strategies that will do emerging managers or um, more, niche, more niche managers. The managers that are going in, in your program are, are managers that have proven that they can consistently generate uh, first and second quarter performance, fund after fund after fund. 
and they're the names that um, that you would be familiar with. Um, so the, the Vanguard program uh, is an investor in names like Bain Capital, uh, like Tomo Bravo, uh, Excel Partners, which is one of the um, venture funds in the world, early stage investor. In the Criteria that we use in making these decisions is, is one, we want to see a proven track record from the team. We want to see a structure within the organization that's built to last. And what does that mean? Um, there's alignment in how economics are distributed throughout the team, but there's also consideration around succession that the firm will last beyond senior partners or founders as they build current jobs. We also want to make sure the strategy is relevant to what the opportunity is today. Sometimes um, best performance is generated by the actual selection of the strategy, not always the selection of the manager. And I think that, that holds true both in private markets and public markets. Finally, we're just highly selective. So we're investing in a single digit percentage of the funds that we evaluate, and it's a very small single digit percentage of all the funds that are practicing in the market. How many investments do you typically see? How many managers are you investing in? Yeah, so the, the program that you're uh, considering will invest in roughly 25 managers over the life of, um, of its, its investment term. Um, the, uh, and, and that's fairly consistent of all the funds that we're, we're investing today. If the term is shorter, the number of managers might be fewer. Um, if the term is longer, the, the number of managers may be greater. Okay. Sounds like you, you mentioned you guys are highly selective, which I'm, I'm sure you are given your track record. I'm sure you guys have the kind of the pick of the litter. Uh, the breadth of the investments, does that tend to, it seems it seems from a naive standpoint that if you get up to 25, that the tail end of that wouldn't, wouldn't have such a strong performance that the bulk of the performance would be in the, the you know, the top half. I mean, is there, is there any argument to only go with 12, uh, 12 managers to boost the return? Um, so we, we have a data in-house data scientist and scientist and risk officer who we run many Monte Carlo simulations utilizing industry data, not just our data, but in industry data. And that suggests that the optimal number of investments for a portfolio is in that, that 20 to 25 range. I think you also have to consider that we are investing in different types of strategies within a range. So there will be uh, a smaller portfolio of venture funds, some growth funds, some leverage buyout funds. Um, the, our our 10-year IRR, if I just talk about our primary portfolio, our 10-year IRR for global primary, so consider every deal that we've done uh, since 2011 is about 24% in our 10-year IRR for, for U.S. where Ryan Bay is, is approaching um, 30%. So, I think we've had a very high success rate. We, there is more dispersion in private equity. So, for example, in, in our portfolio today, uh, we have a China-based fund um, that's currently a 2x fund, um, which is a NAS about um, we, we manage our investors to expect returns that will generate anywhere from 2 to 3x net. Um, and I think if you were to look at the the concentration of performance in our portfolio, you would see consistent performance around well, the, the high one point to, uh, to probably four x that's right over seventy five percent of the funds that we have been um, There are disappointments as well, and uh, sometimes those disappointments are related to the quality of the manager. Sometimes it's related to the selection of the industry or strategy, and sometimes it's things that are out of our control. And, Manager um, just fails to have built um, a firm that was built to last, and, and they disintegrate. But but our loss ratios are, are extremely low. Uh, I did this analysis for another one of our investors uh, a month ago or so. There were 175 deals that we invested in over the last um, 10 years, and the fund that lost money was less than five. And I think that's something that we're very proud of. So, um, 
Yeah, so that gives a, a sense of the concentration. Um, I think it's always nice to have that long tail upside outcome like the one I referenced because that does help cut down some of those, those larger performing, um, shorter performing. Great. Hello? Yeah. Uh, can you uh, uh, elaborate? What's the secondary portfolio? Yeah, so I made a brief comment on the first name strategy. So the primary piece is where we select private equity managers, like I said, that have proven to be very strong performers in what they do there. But for those that are close to the private equity asset class, they, they, they're recognizable names, they're household names. They're, they're names that you would read about in the Wall Street Journal and we'll be many of the, the most high profile private market transactions. Secondary is a strategy where we actually offer liquidity to investors partway through their um, investment journey. So a, a a private equity fund with a 10 year term, there's oftentimes an investor will be in a 10 year commitment, but they'll want to keep liquidity maybe five years into that 10 year term. And our secondary team will come in, they'll price, the, they'll underwrite the assets, price the assets, make an offer, purchase the investment that's already been made, and they'll also assume the unfunded obligation that that original investor has going forward. Um, so that's, that's a very fundamental basic. Explanation of what secondaries are. Secondaries is evolving market and it's getting increasingly complex, but I could probably spend an hour or more uh, explaining all different types of secondaries. What's nice about the secondary um, is when, and I believe this part of your portfolio, you're typically purchasing your funds, the funds that you're buying at a discount that you need. So there's an inverted J curve, and you, you have a very positive IRR experience from day one. And, and that's very important in private equity because there are some strategies in private equity where you may lose money in the early years before you inflect and start compounding at a, at a very high rate. So secondaries allow you to have a very good investment experience from, from day one. And then direct co-investing is where we partner with the managers that we have limited partner relationships with to invest directly in the companies that they're investing in. So oftentimes we'll have partners that want to buy a company, but they only want to write a certain size equity check and they need a partner who's like-minded to come in alongside them and fill out the, the rest of the, the equity opportunity and we will step in and be that partner of choice. So those three strategies um, are very complementary within a, a diversified, highly diversified portfolio. And that, that's been part of what we've discussed. The, the, one of the names of building the fund the way we did is for that diversification. We always talk about it with our public investments. But on the private side is making sure how any of our clients are getting that diversification by primary, secondary, co-invest types that um, talked about as far as growth, VC, and then also globally. So all those elements of diversification that we were looking for is only fun, but also part of the partner with expertise in all those three as well. What's to the typical size of the investment that you make in the secondary and or primary market? Yes, yeah, so, so secondaries, it can be fairly, fairly broad. And, and we do have a, a core secondary fund. It's a secondary only fund that we call Dover. And the Vanguard fund participates, the, the secondaries in the Vanguard fund participate alongside that secondary fund. So we will do transactions that could be you know, $50 million in size. We can do transactions that are a billion or a billion and a half dollars in size. So we're, we're investing, um, we, we have a fairly broad range of uh, uh, investment capability. You said the fund has uh, 40 and 20, you have about 60 billion in, in total at, at our request. We had 40 million in prime, 40 billion in primary and 20 billion in secondary, is that sort of the total portfolio for Harbor Best? And then the rest is about 20 billion. So I think our total AUM is, is 76 right now, and it's roughly 40, 20, 20 primary and secondary direct. And that goes back over a 30, you're looking back over 35 years. So that's not active capital that we're managing right now, it's the capital that we raise throughout our participants. Uh, we'll also say on the primary side, 
time, we might write a check as little as five million dollars, and the check as large as a hundred million. And the reason we do that is on the primary side, we're giving our investor access to the entire private market opportunity. So it could be a seed investment opportunity, where it's just an entrepreneur and an idea, and and it could be a big um, public company that drives the whole transformation. So, for example, in our venture portfolio, we are very we had very early stage access to uh, to Excel uh, or to Facebook through our partnership with Excel. That turned out to be a four hundred x deal for our investors, um, but it was a very early stage investment. Also, one of our managers on the buyout side, Silver Lake Partners, which is a leading technology focused fund, partnered with Michael Dell about seven years ago or eight years ago to take Dell private so that Michael Dell and Silver Lake together could navigate a longer term transformation uh, that ultimately turned out to be very successful through some important divestitures, acquisition, and then a reverse merger with VMware uh, that brought Dell public again. And, and this is I think that's a great case study for the, the type of value that private equity can bring to a company and a, a CEO or an executive team and helping a company navigate a very um, complex uh, transformation. Thank you. How much, um, how much, how much visibility into into the investments do you give? The, you know, the investors. So if Fairfield, you know, the pensions were to invest, what level of, of transparency and clarity are we to be giving to us in terms, in, in terms of the investments you make, the managers you're with, so that we can track it? Yeah, so, so maybe, let me start at the top. First, from transparency from the investments that we make in the managers to Harbor Best. Um, there's very strong transparency there. Um, I talked about information in the unit a little bit earlier. In some cases, we have a better information advantage than many of our competitors because we're we're large investors and we sit on the advisory boards of 80% of the funds that we invest in. So that's that's a very important starting point. Um, and then through uh, our reporting, uh, you will have very detailed a very detailed understanding of um, your investment performance. To the extent when we don't list every you won't see every portfolio company. Um, you, you do have the ability to see top, some of the old things, but there, there will be, you know, literally hundreds or even thousands of portfolio companies underlying. So that would just be a lot of data to deliver to you. Um, if you did have a question on a portfolio company or a sector that might be in the news that you want to know if you have exposure to, that is that is always uh, something that we're able to deliver on. We always have investors um, asking those types of questions. So. For example, there was a very high profile profile IPO of a venture back cloud computing company called Snowflake um, in late 2020. Uh, it, at the time, it went public was the largest creator of capital gain for, for Harbor Best and its investors. It, it generated about a half a billion dollars of value for our investors. And as a result, because of this great a lot of in publications, we had many investors asking us what their exposure was. To not only that company, but other companies that were, were like it. Thank you. Anyone else? Any questions? I have a quick question. Go ahead. Uh, early on, you used the term uh, platform strategy, I think. Uh, have you already answered the question? I mean, I mean, how would that, could you differentiate that approach from any other uh, that Harvard you might take? So we, we talk about everything we do is, is the Harbor Best platform. And if I just pick the three strategies that are part of the program that you're you're considering, it's the primary, secondary, and direct. And that is our platform. It, it's basically our network. It, it'll, it allows us the information advantage and the access that I, I talked about before. There are competitors of ours that do only primary investing, and they do it really well. Uh, there are competitors of ours that do only secondary investing. And they do it really well. And there are, well, there aren't any competitors that do direct home investing because you need manager relationships in order to do that really well. We have uh, over 150 investment professionals around the world that are focused on a specialization in each of these strategies, and they're sharing on the information and access that comes through each of these strategies. And by 
executing on each of these strategies with the scale and with the, with the team that we have, we think that that defined as a platform, you know, puts us in a, in a very unique position from a competitive management standpoint. We're not alone in doing that, but I think there are very few that are on this team with us in the same line. Scott, one last question. Do you do any direct investing yourself or is everything for other managers? Me, me personally? Not, not me for the firm. There's 700 people. I would think you'd be, have enough people there and enough talent to be competing with Bain and yeah. Sequoia, et cetera. So, so when I refer to direct co-investing, that is our direct investment strategy. And we have chosen not to compete against you know, Bain or Insight Venture Partners or Anatoma uh, Brava, who are some of our most important relationships, because the, the benefit or the power of the ability to co-invest and partner with those firms is much greater than you know, the benefit that we could deliver to our investor about trying to just be a, a direct investor on our own and competing with those organizations. Um, we have seen some try to go compete, and and basically that breaks away the power of the platform. We want to be you know, inside venture partners or Toma Bravo or Bain's partner of choice. We want to be their first call, and we want to have access to the co-investment deal flow, not only through those three managers, but through you know 50 or 100 managers that we might have relationships with through the primary and secondary side. And we believe by I mean, that type of deal flow at the top of the funnel will have really great deal flow when it gets to the bottom of the funnel. Now, now we do offer to co-underwrite deals with these managers. So oftentimes we'll align ourselves with them at the very front end of the deal process. And we have an, a relationship with bank consulting where they uh, are on retainer and will come in and help us do industry analysis and strategic analysis on the companies and the sectors that we're looking at. And oftentimes that's a value add deliverable that we can bring to the table with the partner that we partner with. Especially on the smaller mid market side where maybe those firms don't have the same resources to, to call on a bank consultant to provide that type of value. But there we're, we're in lockstep with the manager at the very beginning, diligencing the deal and underwriting the deal as a partner. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyone else? We're good. All right. Thank you. Of course. Yeah, thank you very thank much. You. Really appreciate your, uh, your your making the time for us, um, Ariel. Thank you for uh, holding down while uh, Scott was reconnecting with us. And, and I, I might close by saying our, our we really value our partnership with Vanguard. Uh, and a, a great partner, and they did a lot of due diligence on us along the way. So trust that they they probably do similar or greater level of work on the managers that they choose as this meeting. So uh, just want to give a give a, a shout out to Vanguard and thank the town of Fairfield for consideration in the Vanguard Harbor Fund. Thank you as well, Scott. It was nice seeing some of you a couple of meetings back. Um, uh, with, I think, a different iteration of this group, but it's been a joy working with you all through a couple of um, these sessions. We are always happy to take your questions, and they're always smart, and so um, if you'd like to have us back any time, we'd be happy to. Thank you. Okay, have a nice evening. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Ariel. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye. Oh. All right, so we've been talking to our company here for several months in a row. Um, we've had Lexington and Nazaro in, um, right? We've mm -hmm. had kind of done the scrub course, scrub course. Um, we've had harder events to come back. Mm -hmm. um, I'd, like to, I'd like to bring the discussion around to the allocation decision on private equity. Um, I don't know, Jack, if you want to uh, take it from here. You've done the most work for us recently. Sure. I, I think our target allocation is 5%. I think we're pretty close to that now when it's going to start tapering off. Is that correct, Brian? Yes. Yeah. Distributions? In, in the presentation, right now we're over allocation mm -hmm. because, um, especially with the second quarter performance, or I should say the first quarter performance, mm -hmm. it's not a lag. So we're 
the allocation has gone over 5%, but those investments were made in 2009, 2013, 2017, so we're starting to get higher distributions. And um, we've tried to do the cash flow modeling that will start to go, what we model maybe 2022, start to get below the 5% allocation. So you'll have to start committing now, or meaning like 2021, to try to keep that allocation. Because when you make, say, you may make a decision to make a commitment in 2021, that investment is not going to get called until 2022, 2023. It doesn't get called all at once. It goes in at different stages as they find different investment. So, yes, I think from a timing perspective, it's a good time to make a new allocation in order to keep that long-term strategic target mm -hmm. of 5%. Mm -hmm. I think there are a couple of pieces here. One is, one is do we want to maintain a 5% allocation mm -hmm. and that be kind of a, a consistent allocation rather than make a decision about any point in time investing XYZ dollars into private equity? To get to that allocation, right? Um, and and that's you know, I think I think that might be something we want to take a, take action on this evening. Um, and then secondly, would be choice of managers, um, you know, in order to, to maintain that five percent allocation. Um, uh, uh, just to add a question mark. Looking at the uh, numbers that were sent. No hand on the other Looks like they have $36 million of market value in the private equity family. That sounds about that to me, Maybe a little bit less. Uh, so, private equity is $36 million. Yeah. Let's see. Private equity is $34.7 million as of the first quarter. Just look at your numbers. Sure. That's the case. Uh, all four of the five funds that were in, what they were, what we could produce, etc. Yeah. So, uh, you know, market value 34, okay, 34740. Right. So, what is, what is the, uh, what's the other phone? 468877. Oh, right. Seems to me like we're probably considerably above. Do you use the market value? I'm not, I don't know what it is. Yeah, so, right. So, uh, what, what is the, I don't know whether it is, it's how much it was put in or what. Market value is relative to the portfolio that we have to use as the benchmark to make a decision to add or subtract. I think it's the latter. Yeah. It's got to be the market value. Oh, we think so. Right. so. So, so we're at seven. We're at seven. Right. So we're not doing anything. Well, I, but I, if I remember from the conversation, exactly a lot of hallmark on our best. And, uh, <laughs> the issue was you know, thought that. Maybe swap out Lexington or somebody who put in this as a, a lower performer. Hmm. Um, mm -hmm. would had his endorsement. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the conversation. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're all on the same team now, right? You're right. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, co CFO. Or, oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so I, I just wonder if, if you we're. Know, Taking one versus the other, uh, we're, we're comfortable that we're already at seven and a half percent, and want to be there, or maybe just liquidate something and as, or let it run off mm -hmm. and, and not invest anymore until you get back down to five. I think that's something for the committee to, mm -hmm. to either say yes, we want to be at seven and a half percent. Yes. To me, at least we have to be. Uh, following the plan. Mm -hmm. okay. So, is there a way to bring the presentation on the screen, or I have it on my laptop? So it's 15. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. And 17, which shows how it all starts to, to run off. And that's the point. So, first, yeah, this, uh, we don't want to liquidate anything because we don't want to sell it. It's more of a roll off, roll off right. as we get the distribution. And those are accelerating. We're coming to the end of the life for some of those funds. So, for instance, right at the end of July, we got 1.2 million distribution. I think is the most is most that we've seen in a while. That's not reflected in the, in the numbers yet. Um, so we we've, we've done page 
Tell me that in the 17, if you bring that up, it'll show that waterfall. So we're making the assumptions of when the distributions come, and we're assuming a 4.5% growth of the overall portfolio each year, the X, the other investment. And that's how we're trying to decide it. But we have to look at it each and every year yeah. as far as the commitment in 2022, 2023. Because Harbor Vest will be raising a new fund each year in order to, to, to keep that target allocation and that diversification. So the Harbor Vest ran uh, If you go on one, one more, so there's a specific fund. Correct. Correct. It's, it's, a, it's a clump of that fund. No, if it's an SEC answer. I, I would question the cost on the basis that there appears to be multiple levels of managers here. So we we'll fund the fund the fund. That's right. Yeah. And, and when you start adding them all, you know, what Vendor charges is doesn't necessarily you know, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So uh, I could speak to the, the, the fees, right? So there's Vanguard is not receiving the funds. The, the fee is going to Arbor Vest and these other buyers. It, it, it's mentioned as a Vanguard Harbor Vest fund because it's unique to Vanguard investors, and our manager research team has done this due diligence on Harbor Vest. And Harbor Vest is the investor. And so, what we've done as a company, our Vanguard, is leverage our size and our scale to get terms that an investor by themselves couldn't get. So. For instance, the fee to the harbor back is about 21 basis points. And then there's any additional carry, um, which refers to carry if they exceed their target of 8%. Um, but that fee to harbor best is only 21 basis points, 0.21%. Whereas Brian and I, and maybe Jack as well, went through the private placement memorandums for Lexington and for, for um, Mesero, and those are more in the ballpark of. 0.75%, 75 basis points, or 1%, um, to give some comparison. Is, is that fair to say? Yeah, I think so. Right. So we do we did that. Uh, if you think about like, yeah, how we explain this, mm -hmm. if he goes in and says the ultimate investment, let's, let's just say all of the bank. Uh, and the bank's probably 2 and 20 uh, for the money that they take in. So if we're paying 21 to Harvard, and then Harbor Vest is then paying uh, two and twenty on their investment in vain. You go directly to Mesero. I'm not mm -hmm. Mesero or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't you don't have an intermediary in there or a second fee. Uh, unless I don't know what no, that's the same. But the second fee is the twenty one basis point. That's that's the second fee. Would it still have the two and twenty or the the you know, one and you know 18 or what they want to do. So it's, it's an additional 21. Yeah, which isn't nothing, but. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and we estimate, estimate the fee for the, you know, the general partners that Harbor Vest is investing in. Mm -hmm. So for the, the estimate that they make, you know, we come with them is about 1% of the fee, and then those general partners have a 20% carry. So you're right, the Harbor Vest a fee of around 21 basis points is in addition to the fee that the general partners receive, which is roughly in the terms of 1% and 20% carry. Um, so there's two levels of scale. Of scale. Um, so you talked about Harbor Vest and their experience in the relationship. Yeah. So they are typically getting better pricing with the Thomas Bravo or XL partners or Bain because they've been partners with them for over 30 years. So they are typically getting better fees than say a newer private equity fund, and then we, as Vanguard, are trying to get a better terms with Harbor Map than a standalone investor with say the town of Gary Ann. If, if they try to go to Harbor Map, which they could directly, but they're not going to pay the same as the Vanguard Harbor Map fund. Does that help explain it? So, I, I think I, you know, as a fiduciary, both you and me. Yeah. Uh, I think it's important to know exactly what that's like. And, and if, if the money flows from the pension plan into 
harbor gas slash uh, main or whether it is with it or any other private equity firm. Uh, we let's say we were a participant in 25 companies. Mm -hmm. those, the, those fee differentials are going to be different because of the relationship that Har Harbor Rest has with mm -hmm. may may be more favorable, may not be so with silver like it or somebody else. Yeah. So um, you know, it, it, like it's like Jack said, not nothing. 21 mm -hmm. basis points. If it, 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 it's a, an equity participation or so many basis points, if there's some way we can get a better understanding of what that is, let's say the commitment is 10 million. Right. What is that really going to generate in terms of fees that, that's going to come out of the, the real return? Right. Now, unless the investments are already in place, right. it's hard to say. I, I know that's difficult. That's exactly right. And so you know, what we estimate to come to that number, is the 1.2 percent as a managing fee? Um, you know that's, and then it's hard to estimate above that, but there's typically fees above that because there's that salary that they get to the insert total. Okay. So in that way, in the instance of the better a private equity partner does, and the more fees that they, is almost a good thing because they're above that salary. But on the straight management fee, fees assume a rate of 1.2 percent. Uh, with no cap, one percent roughly from the general partners, point two percent from other banks mm -hmm. to get to one point two percent. And the think of that as the management fee, and that, that's not any incentive. That's like a roll up of what they've seen. That's their projection given you know decades of doing this. Correct. It's a roll up. It's an estimate because yep. you don't know how much they're going to put to right. each of those twenty five managers. And to your point, in terms of be different for each general partner, but that's an estimate based on their prior experience in investing with those partners. So, I, and, and it is in the private placement memorandum that is available to the department. That's, that's all that in the document. And, and Bruce, I think these are all, you know, very, very real, very legitimate. I think it's great that we talk about it. I personally think this is one of the biggest decisions the board's going to make in a while. I think yeah. the uh, the discount rate is something that we have to face, and we may disagree on that. But I feel like doing this, the the fees are exorbitant. They're crazy. They're mushy. They're not easy to really figure out. But the outsized returns that that this asset class has gotten um, kind of seems to cut both ways in my mind. Like, is the gas going to run out? Or are we going to be missing out on something that, like these guys, kind of crack the code in the private markets? Really, are where we can get a, you know, well, a real um, you, you, For the illiquidity involved, you should be able to get something like, uh, you know, another five percent on your money. That's sort of a classic private equity. Because if the market's going to return twenty percent, I would say in a year, five percent more for the liquidity. And I think that in my, I, mean, I do a fair amount of stuff in the private equity yeah. world. So, mm -hmm. uh, and and a lot of the major endowments, like Yale, and they they put fifty percent, mm -hmm. right? And 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 because they, they can, and without maybe a lot of reprisal for alumni or whatever. member, but but we're in a different position, mm -hmm. and, and and I think that. Being more conservative is what we're, our mandate is, whether we like it or not. I'm not conservative, by the way. I have a like love profit, mm -hmm. but you know, this is something that everyone in the board should understand. There is a lot of unknowns here, and, and like what you're just saying uh, is, is this: is they had a good run, and everybody wants to get in when people are producing 35, 40 percent sure. returns, and well. We don't know when that's going to end, or maybe it won't. Right. Maybe, you know, maybe it won't. I don't know that our mandate is to be conservative, personally. Uh, I think it's to be prudent mm -hmm. and to evaluate things as, as they come along, and that's just you know one investment, one decision at a time. I think erring on that side is only prudent, so we need to go into this you know eyes wide open. But I do think it's a, a big decision. Um, yeah. You know, if yeah. we're going to increase things or stay the same, or, or you know, what, what we decide. So. And we, keep your, your, your point, we keep coming around to exactly 
exactly this moment. Right, and, and, and we have chosen kind of inaction rather than action. We, and and we, we, we really wrestled with this. This has been, this has been a final reason. I don't think there's a clear path. Um, mm -hmm. would, love, would love your, your, your thoughts on kind of like, what should we get to? Um, is the allocation like at 5% and above now 7.5%? No, I think it should be higher. I agree with you, higher. Okay. So, um, yeah, no, 5% is, you know. Five percent is dipping your toe in the water. We've been there. We've been this, we've been in that private equity for a number of years at this point for the various funds. Um, the other funds are sweeter funds as well. Uh, gain access to some of the managers. You know, us as standalone Fairfield, they wouldn't be. They wouldn't. Our money wouldn't get past the secretary in the front door. You know, that's why you had to go to the larger plan. And sure. and they're choosing. You know, you know the top of the top. They're not going with the emerging managers. They're going with the top quartile. And they know, okay, if they're not going to produce the next funds, they're not going to be in that top quartile. And, and they all the funds need their – continue raising money every every year, every couple of years. And if they all make those returns, their, their so long-term investors aren't going to be there. Do we have those slides? I thought we had those slides when we did that exercise and we looked at 10%. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. We, we did. We have one slide in here, which is projecting, you know, because we wanted to do some discounts. Discount rate analysis for the plan, and this one just has your current allocation. Correct. Uh, I'll bring it back to your uh, quick question as far as evaluating performance. So, as far as right now, even in the performance report, Lexington and Mesoro are measured against the Russell 3000 index plus 300%. That's three hundred basis point, three um, percent. Slightly different benchmark for Harbor Vest in using. For all countries, world index because there's some global, so it's, it's not the Russell 3000, which is just U.S. based, uh, but it's also 300 basis points over the all country world index uh, for for measuring that. But we did, and you'll see our projections are that 300 basis points over global equity on this slide. Thank you for bringing it up. So in the middle of the page, you see private equity. Our target allocation right now is five percent at the 50th percentile. We think, uh, looking over 30 years, that private equity would generate 10.3%. Really, with that, it's 10.3 is 300 basis points over global equity, mm -hmm. um, which the global equity is not the case because we have U.S. and non-U.S. broken out. You can see our forecasts are a little bit lower for U.S. equity than 5.6, 8.2 for non-U.S. Um, so. Hopefully that kind of hits yep. those points of measurement, where our forecast of returns are, and and yes, um, and when it comes to private equity, who you select is the most important. The manager selection is the most important because there is no passive, there is no index in private equity, right. and who your partners are are so important because they have access to the best deals. If you're a private company, you're going to call the biggest private equity firm. That private equity firm is going to call Arborvest because they've invested in their fund for those 10 years. So the selection, that was all part of our process in doing this. This is the only thing we do in private market. They've been doing that for over 30 years, and they have expertise in those different areas of private equity, primary form of that. And I'm talking a lot, but yes, it, the plan could easily support 10%. Um, to help reach the I'll make a we should be oh, we and, and then I'll just mm -hmm. no more else. Yeah. Um, just put something else is gonna have to give, right? Right, that's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, with an allocation. Well I, we can, it can be that we can go there and we don't have to be there. In other words, mm -hmm. yeah, at some point if you split a, a mandate that's supposed to be at five percent, you're you're supposed to correct to that mean somehow mm -hmm. you know within a reasonable time time. So if I, I, I'm, I'm suggesting that we should be able to go higher, and we, maybe even higher than that at some point, depending upon the experience. Oh. And maybe if I could address Jared's question, you know, where it's going to fund from. Because it's equity, and we also source it from the equity. So for instance, we're looking at this phase, we would source it from your public equities. Mm -hmm. So say we went to 10%, um, I'm going to do the math. You know, we'd go to 30% on U.S. equities, 20 on, on non-U.S., and then 10% to public equities. That's where we fund it from because that is what we consider that 
So I don't know why we would keep it at five, but I would say maybe if we're going to do this, that we say maybe the band is five to 15 rather than one to one to 10. It's just a suggestion. Well, so we, we, do, we, do we need to, um, uh, so I think technically we need to have this to be done. We've never done that in the past. We need to have to make, we need to be a pretty long and free to go through the minutes. Allocation decisions come as a result of looking at the performance. So they're not put on the agenda as a specific okay. allocation item. I mean, we're talking about a private equity decision. And I'm not opposed to it, but yeah. I, we have yep. two very different things that we're doing. One mm -hmm. is changing the policy. Yeah. Allocation the policy. The other one is I have one question because I know the lack of communication from the way we were having meetings, at least I, I, didn't, I didn't connect very well. Uh, <laughs> we did. Yeah. So um, I had this discussion with Brian, by the way. It was just yeah, I don't know. It's just uh, So um, is it the intention that Lexington will be ultimately replaced as it runs off? They're, they're we haven't voted on that. We haven't voted on that. We haven't gotten even to that point. Okay. 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 We're right. not. We're, we're I think that's what everybody's saying. Yeah. I think that's. And, and that's based on. I'm, I, you know, yep. I, we can. Yep. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I just just want to. And how how long a time frame is that? And how much money is that per year? And and the reason I'm asking that we should if we're going to accelerate the percentage investment in the private equity, should there be an immediate um, liquidation of public equity to put in to, to get it going a little faster? I don't know whether how the a fund is actually closed. It's still accumulating money to make an investment now. So there's, there's three, they do three closings a year. Um, people work wise, we probably wouldn't be able to do the closing in both. In the December close. But to, to answer the question, like, then when they do decide to call capital hard investment, and it's no different today because you're still getting capital calls from some of your investments. Yeah. And when when that we get the capital call even right now, but the same would apply to hard investment, we would then, yes, sell this over rate, you know, to get back the target in order to fund that capital call. So right now, say if we got a call for a million dollars, we're overweight public equity, we would sell that. In order to go into into that into um, take in this case harbor Um and then just yeah over to that. And Bruce, just so that you know, I like the diversification right now of having residual electricity and now harbor Okay, you know, and I will stick you know sip, sip my toe in the water and see what it's like. And and then you know if if they do well for us, you know, a year and you know start building up their capital costs and start seeing some returns. I, I think then the uh, other fund is 37%. Yep. Uh, and, and, and that's something to consider here. Is it the timing uh, and opportunities that present in the years when the other two investments were made that give it you know, 15 and 18% returns? And, and was that compared to the universe of private equity firms? Maybe they all didn't perform so well that were the bid you here. Yeah, that bit, yeah, that's just, there's a lot of factors over here, which, you know, one, and again, I rely on you guys who have more uh, access to data that can prove that out one way or the other way. And uh, so, I'm, 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 not, I'm not suggesting that we just, you know, I don't think we can. So, so the same, the first, I mean, first order of business, right? So, you know, city agenda, the agenda item, by the way, is potential action on private equity allocation. So that I think I, I think you want to make a motion to what the allocation should look like. Um, then we can. We can see the Jack, Jack's idea is correct. The band. Make, make the band go to 15, maybe five to 15. Five to 15. One, okay. one doesn't. All right. Stand. So why don't we make for the pension fund? Okay. So why don't we we go to make a motion? Yeah. I make a motion that we. Create a band for private equity that is five to fifty percent. The board will decide uh, at this point in time where they think they should be. Make a second. I'll make a second. Right. Eric, and 
Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstained? Okay, there we go, great. So we'll create, the motion was to create a ban for private equity allocation between 5 and 15%. Yes. Yeah. Okay, we're going to do that. And then whose shoulders do the ball on to alter the IPF? Well, I will. Is that well, the ban part? Well, yes. Uh, yes. I mean, it's for people not to have it. Right. Right. Um, in the way it's structured right now, or in any IPF story, is a target allocation and then a ban, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, right. it's the same with public equity. So I don't know if it's too far for me to say, would you target then 10% and leave the plus or minus 5% ban? Because where is the target allocation? So, I would, it's okay. Yeah, no, I think, I think you keep, I think you keep the wider ban. Um, and maybe the target is 10%. Oh, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. 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 and that's right. Yeah. And so, you know, we have an obligation to update the ICS right. twice a year. We'll do that in the summer meeting. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll come back, we'll be on the August meeting. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. It's very important to make sure that we guardrail those asset classes in the IPS because the board finance of those. No, no, that's the best practice for any kind of process is to have it all documented in the investment policy thing, as, yeah. it is, as it is right now. So the IPS was just last updated in February, I think it was just approved by the committee. And so we can make another update to the IPS this year to reflect Okay. Um, I, while we're on this topic of allocation, um, and I, Jen, I want to apologize that we're running so so far over for you. Um, thank you for waiting. Um, can we talk about a private equity allocation to in OPEP? We do not have an allocation toward private equity in OPEP. The uh, OPEP uh, fund balance is now over 70 million. Um, it, it had a we had that had a 30 percent return to the year. Um, and it may make sense to introduce a private equity allocation to the OPEC. Okay. Oh. Okay. Uh, certainly, maybe the same. Five to fifteen. Five to fifteen. Why? Why? Why shouldn't be any different? Uh, it should. Well, it doesn't. Unless there's liquidity issues that are different. Well, so we're not paying distributions out, mm -hmm. right? Um, the kind of pay distributions out. Um, the fund, you know, the funded status is lower, but you know, it's still in the low 30 percent. Um, and the board of finance makes the decision with the town whether or not to fund it. Um, and so, you know, and I don't think we're going to run into any headroom issue. Um, I think it's an allocation decision, but it would allow us to enter a discussion, right, with managers as we. Uh, um, maybe maybe because there's zero there now and make that zero. Zero and fifteen. So otherwise you have to stay. Yep. That's good. Yep. Yeah. So, so we can make that so headroom. Are we gonna make have a motion? So we're gonna Jack, your turn. Jack, your turn. Well, just, uh, just, just quickly, I, I know this has been an issue with some members of the board of finance. Uh is that there's a if the uh asset class is the difference between the OPEC and the you know, the, uh, and the, the pension fund, and uh, I, I, I think it would help that uh, Brian, you you, you kind of helped me understand it a little bit better. But just just yeah. before we go forward here, if you could recap why that is. I, I just want to be sensitive to you yep. know any pushback we're going to see from the board of finance going forward. Chris, who looked at that slide? Did you put up in the presentation? Is the OPEP is um, slide nine, right? On um, you want Vanguard? On Vanguard. On Vanguard. The one you had open. So, Tom, I think it's a good question. I don't have the historical context of the difference of the asset allocation, but I could say, you know, from a prudent perspective, it makes sense when you think about the funded status. You know, so the um, Carolyn was pointing out the funded status for the pension plan is 84. 86%, I think, as the last year. The OPEB plan's fund status is down about 36%. So, from thinking about long term, trying to improve the funded status, it would certainly be prudent to have a riskier profile, which the OPEB currently does. Think of it more of a 70 30 portfolio versus the pension of 60 40 to help grow that funded status over time. So, to have more risk 
seed the assets a decade or, or private equity. So I think they should be looked at differently based on you know main metric being the funding status and or the, if the discount rate is different between the two. Now, I, I think that makes sense, but why would members of the Board of Finance be concerned about that? I, I mean, I, th I think that's a reasonable position. Yeah, and I can only speak to the story, mm -hmm. you know, reason why was because when we opened it, we had $30 million. You couldn't get a private manager to take a mm -hmm. small position. You'd be paying a very high rate of fees. So it was just not something that was that was eligible to us. Now that you have $76 million, you have a little bit more money in your pocket, now you can actually spread it around and find a private manager and take that money. Okay. It was just too small to commit that nobody wanted it. I mean, I think it's an extraordinary time for OPEB to take to take some money out of the time we reallocate when we get the reallocation, take some money out of public equity and put it in private. No, I think it's an extraordinary time to do that. Yeah. Off of a thirty percent one year return. <laughs> I think we're right. I don't know. Gave you goosebumps. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is, I think, this is this is makes a good talk. Well, I don't think I, I don't think by doing it zero to fifteen, we don't have to do anything. Right. We can discuss what allocation. But as, as uh, Eric has just pointed out, when the, when the OPEB came, I came in here three years ago, it was like, yeah, it wasn't an option. Well, no, because you probably didn't have to make a five million dollar commitment to anybody on an institutional level. So now now we could. Five five million out of seven six. <coughs> Certainly more than it's more than five percent. Yeah, we got a seat at the table. Seven percent. You got a seat at the table. Yeah. So I'll I'll make a motion to uh, add private equity allocation to OPEB beyond the zero to fifteen. Okay. I'll second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Say aye. 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 Any. Aye. Any opposed? Abstain. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. That part. So we want to make a decision about the allocation for the land. Right. Um, yeah. Is the number been bantered about? Uh, I, I don't remember. Nope. Can we go back to that cash flow slide? And I know they're only projections. I think it was one. There's, there's two. One, one is just the pictorial, and the one you just that has to be actual. Yeah. Numbers. Sixteen. But so that. So. Um. Which are 16. Because this yeah. Eric, if you went back one more to the 15, so these are the actual dollar amounts, and then the other ones are the graphical representation of the data on this page. So there, these are the estimates that we're projecting for the capital calls, the distributions for both legacy, the existing private equity, and potentially the euro. So the one thing I'll bring up that if we were to maintain or initiate, continue our relationship with Nigeria and Lexington, those do not fall under the under the offices of, of Vanguard, right? And the and the analysis team to do the check in email. They'll they'll make sure that capital calls they keep track of the capital calls, right. they keep track of the distribution. But as far as the diligence, the ongoing diligence, we lose that capability mm -hmm. um, on selecting the investment. Right, we have to take that on ourselves. So, it's not uh, in the world, but just for those. Uh, make a suggestion that we take, so if we're going up to 10%, right? It's kind of the target. Mm -hmm. uh, so, right now we have a delta of about 2.6, we're at 7.4. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, rather than taking it out of um, private, existing private equity, we think about other equity. Correct. So, say there was a commitment made here in 2021 and the capital call comes in in 2022, uh, we would all equal, all things equal right now, we would draw that from the public equity side. You know, we're not going to, we're not going to consciously draw from back and forth measure until distribution is coming. We don't you know specifically when it's coming, how much. But the net cash, the net cash flow is really, 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 really,
Right. There's seven million dollars coming into the in cash. Yeah. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Five and a half. Five and a half. Five and a half. Five and a half. Actual cash we actually taken five five hundred thousand so the million and a half left. The right? net, the net cash flow. So we're I think about ten million coming in for distributions. You look at how quick your market value is going to decrease. You mm -hmm. can pick up right. actually twenty two million from Metro, um, and then you've got three and a half years left in the fund before any extensions. And it starts to liquidate the fund at a pretty quick um, quick. Um, so we're in, so we've got 450,000 from them yesterday, um, and we So Brian, what what value for the, for the 10, 5 to 15 percent order? What kind of value are you talking about? Now? Projecting you should commit to hard rest. Um, so your, right now, this is the very top. This is at a five percent. Yep. Sorry. This is not at, at a ten percent. It is that very first row. A commitment of twelve percent, excuse me, twelve million, and you know that twelve million will get called in twenty twenty one. So it's a commitment, and then you'll see the capital calls in the next section we're right at. We're forecasting okay, it'd be two million. I don't know if it's going to say that in twenty twenty one, but four million next year, and this is what we'll continuously update. Um, this cash flow model. If we can pay about 17% of the commitment being called in year one, about 20% in year two, and by year five, about 75% of the commitment being called. Did you say those numbers again? Yeah. Year one, is about 17%. Year two, about 22%. And then by year five, we have to be 75% of the commitment. Oh, that made it. Okay, let's call. So that's what a five. That's what a five percent target. That's a that's a five. That's to maintain a five percent target, and that yeah, that's correct. And that was also again assuming that the portfolio grows at four point five percent. These numbers can move as like the denominator changes, right? You know, right now we've been up twenty thirty percent. You know, it gets bigger if uh, the value of the portfolio falls. So that's why. Adjusting it or keeping that band, you know, you need those bands because you'll never be right at five. You'll never be right, right at ten. So we need to build out a value system, right? So we have to wait. So we have, we have two ways. I think we've got a couple of ways to do this. Um, you know, one is I think we want to. I think we want to make a decision on each of our managers, right? Um, are we going to let some run out, for instance? Are we going to free up the Second is, you know, do we want to initiate a relationship with partner members? And, and, and look at a target allocation. At some point, we're going to have to talk the, the dollar figure, um, but we haven't even gotten to the point where we've decided which of the three managers we want to engage with on a going forward basis. I think we've gotten to the point where we don't want to redeem. We just want to let them run out, right? To the extent we want to move on to a different manager, we're going to let it run out. Well, first of all, we don't have to redeem that anymore. No. And we've already decided we're going to increase the allocation. Okay. Right. So that opens the door for all three of them to stay alive. Yeah. And, and, and at successive yeah. meetings, you can sit here and say, mm, not really liking this performance. What's going on? Why, why are we staying with you? Yeah. And you want more money? Well, maybe we're not going to give you more money. That's mm -hmm. Right? So, yeah. it, yeah. so there's nothing wrong given the fact that we've decided we want to increase the allocation. Keep all three and then monitor as it goes. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. Yep. Um, I guess the question would be Harvard best up or down. <coughs> we, don't, we don't currently have a private equity relationship. I'll make a motion to invest in Okay? Jack, you did all the work. I'll step in the motion. <laughs> okay. Uh, any further discussion around that? Okay. Uh, I'd like to take a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Opposed? Stay. Okay, so we now have a we are now in a relationship with our members. Okay, um, we we have you know on the pension side we're already at seven and a half percent allocation, right? Mm -hmm. We can begin we can open up the paperwork, I guess, for the relationship. Correct. Yeah, there's yeah paperwork exactly that. Right. Paperwork from Vanguard to the town, right. and then that's the okay. Vanguard and it's a hard one. And, and now is that enough for us until September that we actually would 
then we'll come back to meet, or do we, do we want to, do we want to set a target amount? If you have Brian with his numbers in the 10% minute, and then we can vote on it. And we can vote on the 10%. Yep. Yeah, can that, we do that? That's fine, because, yeah, we don't, we're not going to be in the next close of the thing is in August, and we're not going to be able to get yeah. the paperwork in yeah. order to say, hey, Harbor got right. that thing, right. 10 million. So we do have the time to make that decision. We'll start the paperwork for starting the relationship with Harbor Bat. We'll update the numbers to assume that 10% we hadn't done to date and present that to the committee as well. I think there's no August meeting, right? No. Nope. So, 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 so those numbers you think that on 5%. Correct. And by the I see legacy private equity getting zero commitments over the next 10 years. Right? Yes. Correct. Uh, so, if it's a million, so you're making a minute, so it just rounds down to a million dollars. And we need to have some clarity and decide how that would actually work cash flow. Let's say you want to keep legacy people, uh, add you commit more money to private equity, which we've already agreed to, how can we balance it uh, in a way that you know, it was meaningful. If we just said, okay, we're, we're adding 5% for you, and we're currently at 7.5 or 7.4, for continue to fund the legacy commitments, to me it sounds like we're more like 12.5%. So we're on band. But uh, not to say that that's something we shouldn't consider, but I, I think that the outflow or how much money we need, we need a chart for them. Yes. And we need to do that. Yeah, and that's exactly how Carol was just teeing yeah. up with it. There's a, yes. a decision yes. of what's yes. the target allocation. Then the commit the, the decision is which mm -hmm. manager. Mm -hmm. So right. there was a motion and now for Harbor like Bath. If there is a motion, this is outside, you know, to make it selected to as well, you know, that has to, the consideration has to be where they are in the fundraising. What type of fund is it? What are the terms? And we as Vanguard, we don't have any oversight of that because we have chosen Harborback as the private equity offer for right. our clients. Right. So the, the decisions, they're certainly within the right of the, the town and community to make commitments to Lexington, Mesro, anyone. But I don't know, we don't, we don't know where they are in raising the funds, right. but they, the terms are with. Well, yeah, the numbers up there for a $4 million outflow for the next two years, right? Um, but which, there, there are chapter calls to legacy private equity at 211. Yeah, and then the zero after that, right? Right, because, you know, there's still a 20, there were still 2017 funds that were committed, and those funds are still pulling capital. So those aren't new commitments. Those are based on their old commitments, and there is a page you go back um, right here. So here yeah. is a summary of the capital commitment, what year, how much capital has been contributed so far. You see that percent funded? So you see some of those funds are pretty mature. Mm -hmm. in the sense yeah. that those, that's why we see the cash flow running off, because it's in our distribution mode. But Mesero 7A and, and Lexington to another extent, they're still calling some capital but you already made a commitment to those funds. So it's not changing that commitment. You can't change that commitment. So this gives a sense of the existing commitments and where you are with that. But Bruce, I could I could swing back with Lexington and Mesro and come up with notes for the board if we want to, you know, figure out where they stand and when their funds are going to go and, and what the fees are and is it a, you know direct investment or the secondaries or whatever? That's that's pretty easy. I can get that easily, and then we can ask. I would assume we could then ask Vanguard, hey, can you rough this in on that top line of the commitment? Mm -hmm. And you guys could put just a number in there, right? Correct. Directed from yeah. so, <coughs> for modeling. Model, yeah. Model, yes. yeah. So that that shouldn't be hard if we want to, yeah. you know, see what that looks like keeping our legacy uh, managers and maybe you know. Yeah, I think mean, yeah. 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 ye
small and really deep I can. That's something that, you know, does Mesro or Lexington you want, you know, let's say it's 10%, so it's $7 million. Uh, you know, and, and is it it might be too small. Yeah, I know mean, I'm not familiar with what terms of what the commitment would be yeah. for and those. But that's a good point. So maybe with that point, we have to decide who goes second. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll make the motion. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 The target of 10%. Second. All right. Second. All right. Um, any discussion? Further? Okay. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Okay. Okay. Great. That helps with what, guys? That brings us pretty far along. Um, okay, just for clarification, on both of these now in September, you're going to vote on the dollar amount funding. And where they're going to, uh, except for OPEC, it's going to go to Harbor Vest, but you didn't put a dollar amount today. Correct. You're going to do that so in September. Did, all we did today was, was determine, determine Harbor the Vest. The band, yep. Right? And then we now determine Harbor a Vest. manager. We've introduced Harbor Vest to both, and, and to the both. manager for us. And with OPEC, we're allocating, we're going to allocate private equity allocation to Harbor Vest. But we're going to come back in September. To make a decision around the allocation now among the potential three managers, the commitment to make pension. to and, the pension side to and the dollar amount for OPEP that you're going to invest in Harvard will be in September. Yes. Okay, thank you. That's what I have. Yes. Okay. Complicated. <laughs> this one was really complicated. I, I couldn't imagine doing this over women. Um, so I, I'm really grateful for having this person. This one this not going to be a women discussion. And thank you. I want to say thank you, Jack. Jack. Jack did a lot of work. Did a lot of that. Just a good call. Very important call. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Um, we we talked about it. Um, well, the pensioners will thank you. Yeah. Take it away now. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, all right, why don't we move forward? I think I think we can talk about the performance pretty quickly because we, sure. we darted in and out of it. We um, still have Jen on the line. Jen, are you able to stay with us for another 10, 10 minutes? Do you want Jen to go first? Well, I'm good. Okay. No problem. Okay, all right. We're just going to run through the, the performance, um, which I think is really straightforward and really quick. Yeah, sure. I can. I'll do it really quick. And You'll do it. If it's too quick, tell me. But, so that's on page nine. Gonna cost you more, you know. Yeah. There we go. Right. Um, so, in summary, uh, another strong quarter from equity standpoint was a little bit on fixed income because rates went down. But as you see here on the page, uh, on a three month return. But this is the okay. If you go to the pension, it's just not. It is a slightly different return on page. Six. Yes. There we go. Thank you. Right. So, return of 6.25% for the quarter. It's above the composite benchmark of 6 or 4.94. That's really going to be attributed to the private equity yeah. manager. You know, because that's the, well, and to principle, the real estate manager, they also outperform. Uh, but it's really the one year number that jumps off the page from the fiscal year. Um, so, the patient to stay with the asset allocation of, you know, led to those great returns of. 25, 0.57, uh, and that's also over the 23.98% in the pocket. So, um, very strong return. So, we'd love to see it again, but, uh, you know, a lot, we've, a lot's come from March of last year, right? And then at the bottom of the page is where we monitor the allocations, again, against the policy target. Um, just as a reminder, the cash we see is $4.8 million. That's to raise cash for the pension payment going out next month. But I also talked about we had a much larger distribution than we typically get was 1.2 million. Um, was that from Mesero? Yeah, that was from Mesero. So that's why the cash was even higher than usual. We're able to run that close to zero for most of the month because we're able to raise cash no problem from our public investment, the fixed income the equity fund. 
Lastly, we talked about private equity. You see that jumped up to 7.4%. It was 6.8 last quarter. Um, and that's because private equity, let's go to the forward two pages. This starts to look at the um, private equity one year returns, but look at the three month returns. This is reported on a lag. So the private investment, this is catching up. This is as of the first quarter. Um, and so they finally marked up some of their investments in the first quarter, and you see those big three-month returns that carry over to some very strong one-year return. Um, so between the private equity and the public equity, that's driving mm -hmm. those absolute numbers for the, the pension plan. Um, you also see it's much smaller, but principal enhanced property fund, that's the private real estate, you know, Certain parts of that market are, are, are doing better. Uh, so you see outperformance from principal on the quarter and on the year. Uh, all of that carries over to the OPEC performance. It's slightly higher than the absolute basis. So a little bit lower. There you go. So over 30% on an absolute return from the one year number. Um, that's driven by a higher allocation to equities, right? It's like about 70% of this portfolio is, is to equities. And therefore, that drives the higher one-year return. Uh, and then all those are very close to the target. Um, also, cash is higher here. We got some contributions with Jared or Brian or Hulka. That came in, you know, that's a lot of good So, there's two contributions, uh, one for each by the time place employees. They're just shy of a million dollars each, which is why we're at the two million dollars in cash. We typically um, we have a buffer of about 15000 in each of the accounts. So we're a little bit below that buffer, and then we got the contribution, which we then invested um, um, first week. <laughs> we the middle of the week of uh, July. Uh, so those are very close to their, their target as well. Um, Pretty no private equity is very exciting. Mm -hmm. you know, we'll see what that does to the fund status. We'll <laughs> I don't know that the actual reception. Was that the fiscal year 21? Was that? Yeah, the 2 million that came in. I think ours. Yeah, I just wanted to take some. What was it? What was it? The health care trust was a little fun? Sure. Check the statement if there's any description. Yeah. All right. Uh, very excited that these are the numbers that are going to grow into the uh, comprehensive annual financial report and the gas fee report. Um, and this will. So you want to quit while you're ahead? I'm telling you, I'm gone. I'm out. <laughs> I know it's time to go. Precisely. <laughs> Oh. I forget the band. I'm going to return. Okay. Um, I don't have any other uh, comments on performance. No questions. All right. Here we go. Hope they like the numbers. <laughs> Again, this one. <laughs> <laughs> that was exciting. Um, okay, so let's let's move on, you guys. Thank you. Um, and you know, congratulations. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, thank you for your level of engagement. I mean, that's really means a lot as far as knowing where we are, why we're at, and, um, and then sticking with that. And you know, we always talk about discipline and sometimes the word thrown around, but that's that's really important to achieving results and sticking with an allocation that's that's that and getting through those up and those all the time. Like it was March it seems so far away. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, and we still have a remember, remembering on, we still have outstanding on um, issues. Mm -hmm. right. so, that, so that doesn't come in, um, the Allianz um, mm -hmm. issue mm -hmm. that we have. Just in case there's anybody in the public on the phone. I think that's both. We don't know. Okay. That's, that's, that's it's usually private executive sessions. Yeah. Well, we're not going into detail. Oh. So, we, so that issue is still out there. Um, let's go, let's roll forward, guys. Here we go. This is like mega meeting. Um, let's go on to the discount rate uh, and potential action. So I have with us um, Jen Kepler, who's an incredible patient. 
Um, I'm sorry, my my guidance time was off by an hour. I, I want to apologize greatly to you for that, and I hope you cooked a really nice dinner while we were uh, coming through this. Um, so she is here, you guys, um, in the, in, a, in the new capacity. Ms. Melman, um, the numbers we're using for the analysis that came around, the math came from Hooker and Holcomb, who are not with us on the line. Um, you had an opportunity, I hope, to give you a heads up to look at the math and the numbers um, at some different some different discount rate scenarios. Um, we can throw them up on the screen. Um, Jen, I think um, perhaps I might turn the, the floor over to you for a moment to just help us frame this discussion a little bit um, as the actuary. Um, I included to the board the, the email that you had sent with me that um, it kind of just provided a little framing, and I'm just hoping you can maybe speak to that um, before we kind of dive in. Sure, no problem. Um, so, uh, as my, my email alluded to, uh, the interest rate assumption um, is typically equal to, for public pension plans, it's typically equal to the, the plan's expected return on investment. Um, and investment income is an important part of your work, of your pension plan because it makes up a majority of the. Oh, oh. Of all right. Funding. I thought you wanted to bring up that form, but that's okay. Um, so there is an actuarial set of practice called the South 27 that provides actuaries with uh, guidance and prescribed guidelines uh, for determining uh, the best estimate of the long term expected rate of return on assets. Um, looks at the you know, various factors, including uh, mainly the plan investment policy and their allocation, and the allocation uh, in estimating expected long term rate of return. Um, I noticed in the handout for that uh, Carolyn had provided to me that Vanguard's current, and I had a discussion tonight about asset allocation, which will probably, which will likely change some of the analysis going forward once those allocations are changes are made. Uh, but currently, um, Vanguard's analysis of the like, long term, the median expected long term rate of return is about 6.2%. I did some quick analysis on my end, and I'm getting a number of almost exactly for that. So that's great to hear um, from my perspective that we're on the same page as Vanguard um, and what the, what the true assumption really should be. Now, that being said, this plan is still at currently at 7%. So relative to what the long-term expectation is, your, your assumption is high. Um, and as you, I'm sure you all know, a higher interest rate assumption um, means a lower liability and vice versa. Uh, because the expected future cash flows of the plan are being discounted at, at a higher rate. Um, and when you have a higher uh, interest rate assumption that's too high, you're undervaluing the plan's true cost and therefore uh, introducing an inequity amongst current, a few current and future generations of taxpayers. Um, you're undercharging current taxpayers and future taxpayers are going to have to take up the bill. It also can lead to potential uh, investment losses because if your assumption is too high relative to your actual allocation, uh, your plan will persistently underperform, leading to losses and volatility and your contribution going forward. So, while lowering the discount rate and interest rate assumption is painful because it does increase your liability and lower your funded ratios and in the short term, increase the the contributions that the town would need to put into the plan, long term, it provides for more stability, um, more likelihood that you're going to meet the assumptions, better uh, interge intergenerational equity. I'm going to view favorably by credit rating that you're using a realistic assumption. All those things are positive things with respect to the interest rate. Um, they're long term in nature. Um, and you just have to kind of withstand the short term kind of shock. That being said, I think the timing for this is, it couldn't be more perfect after the year we had um, with the planned investment return. Um, you, you know, so the, the numbers that were, were the estimates that were put together by Hooker and Holcomb off of the 2020 valuation, you know, that, but that's a year, a year ago, but here, 
the events of the event go well, that I imagine that that's going to you know, be your favorable for the system. Granted, the favorable investment experience is going to be recognized over a five-year period because you just lose that your asset. You do smooth asset, so uh, which is a good thing. Um, so any any favorable returns won't be recognized immediately; it'll be spread out over time. Um, but that being said, I mean, you will be in a favorable position to, to, to potentially have the investment gain offset with the cost of lowering the interest rate. The function of the so, the time, from the timing perspective, um, we won't know exactly where the numbers fall until we get all the, the, the new liability time, but um, the numbers that each uh, hooker and hospital did pro provide will give you this is a good relative, a good expectation as to the relative change. Um, uh, for changing your discount, your discount exception um, under the scenarios they provided. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, why don't we uh, set up, um, Chris, you can set up that slide that you're looking at right there and, and take the, the Hooker and Holcomb um, by so the Fairfield 2020 Valuation Presentation Extension Board Interest Rate. We'll look at this one. Yep. Open up that one. Okay, so all right, so we have them run run some scenarios. And again, that's not this is not from penal line, this is on the last year's value. Um so we're Jen, Jen's right, our performance has been pretty um will have will have a nice positive impact. Um and also some of the cost of the of the change of the of our discount rate. Um, I have them run 7%, 6.9, 6.8, 6.75 um, at a 2.4% inflation rate using the pub tables that we use. Um, and as you can see, um, you can see how, to, how the numbers work out. Um, Jared, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what the town will look most closely at is going to be the, um, the ADAC. Yeah, can you scroll down a little bit, Chris? Sure. Okay. Um, from our standpoint, we want to make sure that we are, you know, that that, that we're kind of doing right by the plan. Um, you know, we, we will be delivering, you know, kind of change of the liability assumption, uh, which would result in a increase in the ADA. Um, you maybe want to. Uh, so this is this is just the town side, and the next one is fire. Yes, maybe want to go to the end. Want to go to the end and look at the yeah. Uh, combine this one. Yeah, all the way down the bottom. Okay. So it would move. So the, the column on the left at 11.6 million, the third third set of numbers up from the bottom, that's the at the current, that's a 7%. And then as you move over to the right, it goes 6.9, 6.8, 6.75. Okay. Um, so it's moving about 600,000 <laughs> per 10 basis points. Per 10 basis points. And this is just for the pension. Right. Right. And we'll have to, a similar a similar outcome, I think, to the folks have. Um, the other thing to put into the back of your mind, um, I don't intend to to look at it, is the is the comparable. Right? We're looking at our neighbors. And Chris, that's another set of screen if you could pull that one up, which is the spreadsheet. Um, <laughs> there it is, the one on top left. So this is with, with Jen and Melanie's help um, pulled data out of the uh, out of the various town filings. And we'll put that up there, and this will show you all based on last year's, you know, all based on the same kind of sets of data. Let's just shrink that a little bit. And we'll it fully open. Might just be a preview. Oh, there it comes. The yeah, so there it is. There it is. Um, and then I was sort of. Started it. We we did, I did a sort from highest discount rate to lowest discount rate. Come on. Okay, so when you see the numbers, that's that's how it goes. Um, and if you see where we are, Fairfield is seven percent, right? Last year's Gatsby has us at seventy eight point four eight percent funded level. Um, and you kind of see where we're where we're lumped in up in just similar in Norwalk. We are uh, similar there with Weston. Greenwich is at six point nine with a seventy six percent. Funded ratio. Um, I thought it was important to see these numbers side by side to get a sense of how 
So if you do, in the lower rate corner, can you shrink that a little, get that down to even further, get down to 100 percent? The bar. Yeah, the bar at the very, very bottom. Yeah, right, 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 right there, yeah.
more money into the fund on behalf of the baby from the town? Right. Right. So I think you pay the piper now to not have surprises later. So, uh, so Carolyn, you're suggesting I think it's important. I'm sitting here, and I don't know how many people understand this. Because uh, I, I think we should try to take a more conservative approach. Because we don't want to have surprises that make somebody upset. But I, I, I think a seven percent return is a very reasonable expectation given the markets that we've lived in over the last ten years. And I thought how we can serve right. as we, yeah. as we've seen. Yeah, it, it, the, in my mind, mind that doesn't mean we don't know what's tomorrow. I mean in my okay. in my mind when I was looking through all of this number to put a number out there, I was buying kind of a seventy fifth percentile number that Vanguard had I kind of put it that 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 that's between six point eight and six point nine percent. To me, that just felt like whether that's 6.875. To me, that that kind of came right down the middle between kind of the Vanguard, the Vanguard analysis, what we've seen in some other towns, um, and you know, pulls us down a, a little bit. It's a little more conservative than that. But I'm not in the camp that you want to go meaningfully lower. I, I'm with you on that. I mean, but you know, I'm, I think the investment returns are going to remain pretty strong. Well, this is the picture board. We made it after seven. Yeah. And we cut down and we moved it down almost every time. And <clears throat> the pension plans, when you look at the five and ten year return, have always been over six and a half, seven percent, historically. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of question. What goes into the Vanguard's numbers and everyone else's numbers? But everyone wants to be a little short. Right? And yeah, what came yeah. into that? Because historically, nobody's seen that. So, yeah, if I, I can address that at a high level. So, for equities, big, you know, input to how you estimate future or expected returns is really valuation. Like, how expensive is the, the market? And right now, it's historically pretty expensive. Think of all the gains we just saw in one year, let alone the last 10 years since 2008. So valuations are high. So either earnings have to continue to accelerate in the oversupplies or those valuations need to come down. Um, and so that's a big input as far as how you're forecasting our equity valuations. And Vanguard is certainly not al alone in forecasting lower future expected returns because where we are from equity valuations. The flip side, uh, alternatively on fixed income, the biggest impact is where are current interest rates and yields. And we all know what happened, let alone in one year versus 10, you know, U.S. federal year, that's zero. And so there's not return that you're getting from fixed income investment. 2008 or something like that, fixed income yields, I think, were 4%. And then, you know, now we're at 1%. So those are the two big pieces that go into forecasting equity. Uh, public equities and fixed income, which is the biggest allocation. Um, so I hope that helps. No, it's not, okay. It's a, what sort of risk, if any, do we run with, say, a credit agency? Do they take a look at the expected long-term reason? It's, I can answer that. Okay. I actually call it. Oh, great. Okay. I, I, call, I call it. I call it. I call it. Do they look at they say, them. hey, Vanguard's yeah. going to be at 6 2 Why are you there? Or uh, they no, see no they, they, they actually, both Moody's and S&P will put in their own discount rates. They actually re reanalyze according to what they think the discount rate should be so that they can normalize it across all towns, all plans, all communities. Hmm. Yeah, they, they don't pay any attention to our discount rates. Um, they watch our funded status. Yeah. That's what they look for is the funded status. Um, we're a double A rated. Um, no, the pension, pensions are double A. The pension, pensions have a separate rating, um, and we're double A, and we're not triple, oh, triple A. Um, we're, a tri we're a triple A town. We're a double A pension, um, and that's a very strong pension rating to have. Um, and we're likely not to go to triple A on pension because we're not 100% folks. And they have said, they, at least one of them said that because we went to. Uh, 
the issue. And uh, they commented on that and that are on the status of